there are types of hearing loss. Um, mostly it, it will be, you know, uh, maybe conductive hearing loss, in which in which case maybe the, the most common causes of hearing loss would be maybe, uh, you know, ear infections and everything mm. like that. Smoking maybe may play a role, but yeah. there may be bigger factors. But then when you come to another type of um, hearing loss, where, for instance, sensor neuronal, Come rain, come sunshine, switch my heart and do you will find It's love for you, all I got is love for you. Honey, Jake. How are you guys doing? I hope you are enjoying the hot weather while it lasts. Because it's about to get cold. We will really miss that global warming. You're welcome to the show. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe, hit that notification bell and share. Subscriptions alone on YouTube are decorations if you don't hit that bell. Um, Mondays are for political discussions. Wednesdays are for the educative segment like today. And Fridays are for Bible talks. So today we are having uh, another medical discussion like we did last week. I told you we'll be having another doctor in the studio. And yeah, this is just what we'll be doing today. So once again, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe, hit that notification bell and share. Um, the show is available right here on YouTube every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, 20 hours Central African time. And you can listen to the podcast on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. For those of you that strangely love audio podcasts, I don't know. I just can't do audio podcasts. I'd rather watch. Yeah, but some of you say that you'd rather listen when driving or cooking or bathing or washing or whatever you do when you're listening to podcasts. I, do, I barely even find time to listen to music. But yeah, anyway, you're welcome. So on the show today, we have Dr. Cholwe Shatewa. He is a, um, well, he'll describe best, but he's a medical doctor working with the university teaching hospital uh, in the Department of Ears, Nose and Throat, or what they call ENT, uh, graduated from the Copper Belt University. He is a brilliant doctor. I think you'll learn a lot from him today. You're welcome on the show, Doc. Well, thank you very much, Dan. It's good to yeah. see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Yeah, we've been talking on the phone. Uh, it was it was a bit hard to, to direct you here. Yeah, I, I had to get lost here. <laughs> it's complicated there, to get here. Yeah, finally got here. <laughs> How have you been? No, I've been great. How have you been yourself? I've been doing well. I've been lovely. I'm a blessed young man. You know, I yeah. just uh, had my baptism yesterday. Already? Great! Yes. I thought that's done with you, much younger. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I guess it's okay. <laughs> what was uni like for you? Med school, I hear a lot of stories about. Yeah. Uh, the struggles of med school and... Yeah. Especially with Copper Belt University. I don't think I have interacted with... I'm trying to remember, just in case there's a doctor from there that knows me that's watching. But mm -hmm. I don't think I've interacted with a doctor from CBU. Okay. There yeah, what was... Uh, quite plenty of doctors from CBU, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. I know many from uh, UNSA, mm -hmm. Apex and whatnot. Yeah. But what's med school like from the CBU perspective? Oh, yeah. Um, well, it was an interesting journey. Yeah. So to say, um, CBU is a, it's a renowned university in itself, quite fine. Uh, also, it comes with challenges that come with it being a public university. Yeah. Yeah. So it was. Um, it does was, it feel like a public university when you're there? Definitely. It does. Yeah. <laughs> so is yeah, it, it has quite features. similar to UNSA? I should think so. Uh, in the in the aspect of like, um, in many regards, actually. Um, selection criteria, um, the fact that most uh, students depend on the government for sponsorship, you know, yeah. things to do with, with, with such a thing. But uh, regardless of everything, it was also um, quite educative for me. I, I got to grow in many aspects in, in terms of my leadership. Yeah. Um, I, I got to lead the students via the students' union. I was their president. Um, oh, nice. Yes. Uh, I, I got to learn a lot, not just in terms of like the medical knowledge, yeah. but um, other aspects of life as well. So it's it's a good university. 
I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just <laughs> saying it's 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 a true public university. It's a true public university. Yes. Yeah, I like that description. Yeah. But was life fun for you? Definitely. Do you it, do you it, miss? It, would you go back? It was fun, but of course, um, I was mostly studying. <laughs> and I, I always had an assignment and everything of that sort. Yeah. So I can't say it was fun. That school really is tough, eh? It, it's really tough, yeah. But of course, we we got the time to to do other extracurricular activities yeah. here and there, yeah. So uh, I was really busy back in med school. Okay. Yeah. And how long have you practiced medicine for? Um, I, I've been practicing since 2020. I joined the Invest Teaching Hospital. Um, yeah, so that's I, about three years, eh? Yeah, so I did my internship. Once I was done, I was retained in the Department of Surgery, um, particularly in the ear, nose, and throat. Yeah. Yeah. Is it common to have young doctors at uh, UTH or is it something that's only happening now? We had Dr. Katam yeah. on the show last week and yeah. he's, I'm sure you know him. Yeah, he's fairly young, yeah. <laughs> and he's fairly young. <laughs> yes, I believe you're young too. Yeah, yeah. So is it is it a normal thing or it's just something um, that's beginning to happen now? Uh, or do you have a lot of fellow young doctors there? I think that p perhaps in the past, the average graduating age might have been maybe 27, 28. Yeah. But I feel... As of now, people are graduating much younger than Much that. earlier. Yes. I mean, because some of us were finishing high school at the age of 16, yeah. uh, getting to university. Maybe you get into university at 17. Mm -hmm. If you do seven years, ah, you guys can do the math. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you are, you've been there for three years. What's the exact area of your expertise? What department are you? Okay. So um, medicine is a, is a long journey. Yeah. Yeah. So since I graduated in 2019, I've been working towards becoming a specialist. So like I said, I finished my internship and now I'm a surgical trainee okay. uh, with interest in, in ear, nose and throat. So basically, I, I participate in the entire curriculum of the surgical department. Yeah. But later on, in a few years time, I'll, I'll focus strictly on the ears and throat. So but even for now, you... Yes tend to you tend mostly to yes, yes. Uh, ears nose and throat yes, did you choose that or you were i chose that why you, what, you, what prompted you choose uh <laughs> you'd have to choose okay i i know i know some people choose uh uh neurosurgery yeah or the heart yeah yeah why did you choose ear nose, nose and throat, and throat. <laughs> um not that i had always thought about it per se yeah yeah Previously, I thought of becoming a doctor when I was much younger, but in terms of like the specialty in itself, I might not have thought further than that. Um, back in med school, I started liking surgery in particular, so I wanted something surgical, but still, I, didn't, I don't think I, I was specific as to which uh, field uh, I, would, I would have loved to do. Uh, once I did internship, yeah. um, I understood the need for... Um, you know, more specialty in ear, nose, and throat. So I felt that it's one department that's lucky in terms of the human resource. Yeah. Also, it's interesting. Uh, I, I find the pathologies of the ear, nose, and throat quite interesting. Quite interesting. Yeah. When you want to work on someone's ear and operate on the ear, where, where do you open? Uh, it depends <laughs> with what the issue is. You, okay. it's, it may I've be, always wondered that, like, do you yeah. open the head or you just remove the ear for a while? Okay. And then we're, let's say, what's the deepest part of the ear? Uh, the ear can be quite deep uh, as it relates to other structures, not just by itself. Yeah. So it's not just the outer ear that we see. Um, it's housed in a bone, the temporal bone, of which if anything, there are infection, malignancies or anything of that sort can spread to the brain, uh, even the nose, the eyes and, uh, and everything of that sort. So it's, it's not just the, the ear as we know it. But mm. it's the ear as, re as it relates to other structures. So depending on what the pathology is, there are other operations that may require opening via the, the bone, just behind the, the earlobe that we see. Yeah. Others may require going in the ear canal itself. Yeah. Okay. So when it requires going in the ear canal, yeah. does that mean tearing the actual ear? Uh, it may mean microscopic surgery. Oh, okay, yes. okay. So it basically, it depends with what 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 the problem is, and what approach would be used, particularly 
with the pathology that the patient has. So does that mean there is a passage that links all three, the eyes, you said ears, nose, and throat. So yes. the ears, the nose, yes. and the throat, there is a path that links all three. That is definite, yes. Oh, okay. Yes, so yes, can yes. an infection start in one area, let's say the ears, mm -hmm. end up in the nose? Yes, definitely. So uh, for those that you've mentioned, the ear, nose, and throat, there's a definite uh, connection, anatomical connection. But um, with the other structures, there may not be a connection per se, but because of the uh, them being adjacent, for instance, the, the eyes, yeah. um, there's a connection there with the, the, the nasal sinuses. Uh, and so a pathology can actually spread from the nose and affect the, the eyes as well. Yeah. Uh, from the ears, uh, if something gets via the, you know, there's a thin bone separating the ear from the brain. Mm. So it's possible also that an infection can spread from the ear to the brain. Oh, really? So, yeah. So not just the ear, nose, and throat that are anatomically connected, but even just by relationship of these structures being ad ad uh, adjacent, it's possible that uh, all these um, the, uh, pathologies of the head and neck are, in, uh, are really connected. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So is this a a frequent thing that you see at the hospital where people come mm -hmm. with problems relating to the three. Yeah. I mean, when we think of people sick, we think of things like cancer or malaria. Do we still have malaria in Lusaka? Uh, <laughs> I don't think we have malaria in Lusaka uh, anymore. I, I, should, I should read the recent study. I don't think I've read the recent study as it regards malaria. But um, generally, people say there's no malaria in Lusaka. But uh, back when I interned under internal medicine where malaria is seen, yeah. I, I did see uh, some malaria patients. Even now, occasionally, we do get to have inpatients in our surgical field yeah. that, that may develop malaria while on the ward. Oh, so really? I, yeah, so I can't rule <laughs> it strange out. to develop malaria yeah. from the hospital. <laughs> yeah, you know, there are, there are challenges. There's still mosquitoes and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, depending on what measures you put in whether patients have mosquito nets or not. Yeah. Okay. By the way, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe, hit that notification bell and share. Uh, Chofia is not on the show today. Um, he's not on the show this week. Yeah. So I'm here alone, like old times, with the doc. Yeah. So doc, from your perspective, what yeah. do you think is our biggest lifestyle issue that affects the health of our ears, nose and throat? What particular things do we do in our day-to-day -day lives yeah. that, put that, that put us in harm's way with regards to these things? Yeah, so um, first and foremost, I understand that your question is particularly on the lifestyle, but I think I should also acknowledge that I feel, um, personally feel, even from the evidence, that most of the pathologies is an interplay of many factors. It can be lifestyle, it can be genetics, um, you know, it can be uh, environmental factors as well. Yeah. yeah well, but, I ask particularly but, but, about lifestyle. Yeah. Because for me personally, mm -hmm. uh, I'm taking an I'm taking an opportunity on this particular segment of the show. Yeah. This educative segment to learn from everyone that comes here. Yeah. Uh, especially in ways that I would be able to apply in my personal life. Yeah. So if I think I can learn something about what I'm doing in my own life yeah. that would affect this. I would, I would really want to know that. Yeah. But I do understand the environmental issues, and I would like you to touch on that as yeah. well as the genetic mm -hmm. uh, factors, yes. Yeah, so of course, um, uh, there are factors that can, you know, predispose someone to some conditions, mostly smoking. Look at yeah. that. Yeah, because conditions of the ear, nose, and throat include cancers, um, it can include, you know, uh, uh, many other issues surrounding, you know, like pollution. Yeah, but mostly it's things like um, you're drinking alcohol. If you're consuming more than 21 units of alcohol a week, mm. it's a risk factor. Depending, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, that is for males. Females on the other side have to take about 14 units of alcohol. There's a formula with how you calculate this. Yeah. Uh, depending on the meals and the percentage of the alcohol you are taking, uh, smoking habits. Um, you know, these days people are doing shisha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I remember last week when um, we had Dr. Katambo here, we he talked about smoking, how it affects your 
uh, because he was t- telling us about the brain. Brain atrophy. Yeah. yeah. So he was talking about how smoking, and I asked him this question, when you yeah. say smoking, is that a blanket statement to cover everything from vaping to marijuana to cigarettes to cigars? Does that include everything when you say smoking or are there particular ones that are worse than the other? Uh, from the evidence that, that is available, um, tobacco, unfortunately, tobacco is the big one, but um, tobacco <laughs> is known to cause a lot of pathology. So uh, tobacco we, is the worst, we, so it's the legal one. We don't have any evidence that, for instance, marijuana yeah. would cause any problems per se. You marijuana don't say. by itself. Yeah. Unless, of course, the fact that it, the smoke itself maybe may be irritating. But the only known thing in terms of marijuana is that it can um, bring about schizophrenia in, in people who are already predisposed. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. So in that. terms of smoking, of course, I wouldn't encourage anyone to smoke anything. But with, <laughs> with the evidence that yeah, they yeah. are um, vaping to some extent, yes. Uh, okay. sm- is is tobacco, that smoke definitely. that's in a vape? I, I, I don't even I, know. I, I, I may not really be familiar with with that technology. I don't think a lot of people vape in our environment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but but I do know that it's, it's equally not a good thing to do. Okay. Yeah. Would this include smoke from, let's say, people who work in um, factories where they burn stuff? Yes, definitely. This, this would also, yeah. also include yeah. those? Yeah. Let's say leather factories, um, people who work in factories where they, you know, clothing, uh, anywhere where there's basically a pollution of some form, uh, it, can, it will predispose someone to, to some pathology. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, you were explaining about how they are, there is a, a mixture of reasons, yes. uh, starting from lifestyle to um, yeah. genetics to environmental. Mm-hmm. So amongst these, what have you identified to be that key thing in most of your patients? Where have they gotten most of their... Uh, issues from okay. as, as it relates to your field so it the field is a little bit you know diverse mm. the ear nose and throat and general generally a human being and you know their health so it's, so, it's quite so, diverse so it depends each with, yeah so, it, it, so it, many, it depends yeah. with what are we discussing in particular yeah so if say uh, is it deafness is it hearing loss so for hearing loss then um, you would say okay there are types of hearing loss um, mostly it, it will be, you know, uh, maybe conductive hearing loss in which, in which case maybe the, the most common causes of hearing loss would be maybe, uh, you know, ear infections and everything mm. like that. Smoking maybe may play a role, but yeah. there may be bigger factors. But then when you come to another type of um, hearing loss where, for instance, sensor neuronal, uh, mm-hmm. I know that I'm mentioning terms and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe yeah, you can yeah, break that down yeah, for us. Yeah, but um, in essence, um, we're talking about hearing loss and um, conductive and sensory n- neuron are like the two types of hearing loss that, mm. that people can have. So conductive, like, like, like we've said, uh, is basically how is you know, sound waves conducted from the speaker for it to be perceived by the human being. So it's that, that whole area of transit from you know the source as it enters the ear into the cochlea yeah yeah and then from the cochlea it's you know the the sense the sensory aspect of it as it goes to the brain to be perceived so uh, there's a distinction there so in terms of safe uh, sensory neuronal hearing loss some of the major causes uh, actually the second most co- cause uh, is um you know loud music and the, a lot of people are in clubs playing a lot of loud music and, and everything in the world. So, yeah. so for instance, that can be a lifestyle issue yes. that can predispose someone to hearing loss. Okay. Yeah. So wait, people listen to loud music can eventually lead to hearing loss. Definitely. And it's not something that will happen in a week, but, um, you know, uh, deep in the ear, there's an organ called the cochlea that perceives sound. And yeah. inside it, it has these small hair cells called stereocodia of which um, when the waves of sounds are passing, they have to vibrate. Mm. And then if you're listening to loud music, these are vibrating at a very high frequency and they would eventually tire. So they will be, you know, getting fatigued. So uh, for lack of a better term, over time. And over time, someone would develop, you know, a sense of neuronal hearing loss. Mm. Yeah, so, you know, noise is quantified according to the World Health Organization. If 
uh, if you're going above to, uh, 65 decibels of, of sound, um, then that, that's, that's, that, that noise can, can harm you. It can deafen you. Yeah. Can you give an example of what 65, 65 decibels? You say decibels? Yes. Can you give, I don't know if there's even a way to give an example of what 65. Like, like what can sound like that? Yeah, what, what could sound that loud? Can a gun shot? A, a gun is far higher than that. A gun shot is far higher than that. Yes, yes, so sir. meaning being in close proximity yes. to a gun shot is yes. dangerous to the ears. Yeah. How about the shooter? Uh, it's still the, the same thing. I think that's why even some soldiers would be seen with headsets. Depending oh, with the, with, okay. yeah, yeah, mm. but definitely a gunshot is because you know even just a motorbike, the sound yeah. of a motorbike is already above sixty five for for most of these big big machines. Yeah. So in terms of of sound, I feel on a daily basis a lot of people exceed the sixty five decibels that is prescribed. So how long do they have before they stop hearing? <laughs> uh, it will of course people differ, but over time, um, mm. you notice that when I haven't read the local study, but say in the in the Americas, in America in particular, mm. uh, percentages of both children and um, adults yeah. are way above ten percent in terms of like you know this gradual uh, hearing loss that they can develop. Okay, I was watching a movie recently where uh, people were taken to a certain place, yeah. and when they were there, they aged quickly. So. Uh, one of the signs that one lady had when mm -hmm. she began to age is that her ears were, her ears just couldn't pick sound anymore. She really had to, yeah. you know. <laughs> that's that's presbycusis. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Yeah. But uh, presbycusis, um, hearing loss due to, due due to, to old, age. Old age yes. So is it everyone that will experience this as they grow old that their hearing uh, abilities become, become less? Mm -hmm. Or is it certain people only is there a way that we yeah. can preserve our preserve our hearing abilities for longer yeah. of course um <laughs> not everyone can can really be identical but you'd say that on a general scale yes uh, as you age you know systems senses are also coming down mm. so it's it's quite common that the older you are if they did a, a hearing test quite fine someone may be able to communicate may be able to hear, but if you did a, you know, an objective test, you would realize that uh, they have a, a degree of hearing loss. Okay. De depending on uh, whether or not, no, that is significant to depend with you know, the person and the life that mm. they might have lived. Okay. Yeah. And those that were these e hearing aids, yeah. do those things actually work? They do. How exactly do those things assist? I've always wanted to know. Mm -hmm. This is the perfect opportunity for me to uh, learn. <laughs> definitely. How do, how do those people, how does that device help people get the sound into their ears? Yeah. So I'm sure you've seen uh, a form of hearing aid and they may come in all shapes and sizes and they may all target a different thing. They, yeah. they, they may be hearing aids that are, say, cochlear implants. Hmm. Which may be given with to someone who has a maybe sensory neuronal hearing loss arising from you know a cochlear malfunction, maybe a genesis or anything of that form. Um, it may be something that you know is helping the passage in terms of conduction. So yeah. what you're saying is the hearing aids are given depending but depending on on the, on, on the pathology. The yes, yes. Ah, yeah, okay. So you'd have to know what what form of hearing loss is is this particular person experiencing. And mm. at what level would we have to intervene? Okay. Yeah. Doc, let's talk more about the nose. Oh, yeah, sure. What <laughs> issues? <laughs> I know the nose is like a... It's, it's common for people to experience nose issues. I mean, yeah. from sinuses to mm -hmm. flu. Uh, as a matter of fact, we are at danger of all kinds of flu mm -hmm. every now and then. Yeah. Uh, right now, there is anthrax. Anthrax does affect the, the nose, does it? Uh, I, I hear I, there's a flu that accompanies it or I, something like that. I, I don't want to dive into anthrax. <laughs> I, I feel I'm a doctor, yes, but yes. I'm not qualified. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Yeah. So basically, when it comes to the nose, mm -hmm. what are the issues? What are people not doing? I mean, why are we getting flus every year? Is it an immune issue? Is it... Why does an average person have a flu Yeah. every year? Of course, we're now in the era of covid now is coming down yeah but that's just an example of one thing that can cause the flu 
um, you know, viral infections are quite rampant, um, depending on the season, but also other factors like allergies. A lot of people have allergies. Yeah. And we just don't know? Um, definitely. Is it possible you, you, to have an allergy and you... You would know. It's possible if you've not been uh, exposed to the, to the allergen, to the, to the triggering factor. Mm. Yeah, if, if um, perhaps if you've grown for a long time without eating a particular thing that you may be allergic to, you don't know you're allergic, mm. if you eat it maybe the second time, you could have an acute, you know. So what you're saying is all yes. allergies have strong manifestations that you will definitely know. Uh, manifestations will, will, will be ranging. It's not definite that they cannot be prescribed under the same umbrella. Mm. Yeah, but in terms of like, say, having flu, other people, it will be uh, maybe cuts, the fur for cuts. Mm. Um, for other I've people. even seen people that are allergic to dogs. Yeah. Yeah. There are such people. So, yeah, so basically, a lot of things can affect your nose um, in terms of allergies, infections. And, 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 and those things. Cancer, actually, can... There's cancer of the nose. Because, I mean, when we talk of cancer, mm. it's not like it's just in the blood, the way there's leukemia. There are different sorts of cancer, and nearly every part of the body will, will be affected by one cancer or, or another. So does someone with cancer of the nose come to see you, or do they go to the cancer hospital? They would have to... Uh, cancer is, is, is diagnosed uh, in the specialties. Oh, okay. Yes. So if it's an obstetric ca uh, ca carcinoma, it will be diagnosed by the obstetrician. Ideally, in the more developed world, uh, its specialty will also have cancer doctors. So at, uh, where, where I practice, uh, if we identify, a, say, a cyanonasal cancer yeah. in a patient, then we would have to wake up such a patient to know at which level they are at. We stage them. Uh, we have to know the exact form of cancer that they have so that we now plan interventions depending on what we found. So the intervention can be surgical, of yeah. which it will be our responsibility to, to, to operate, or it may be something that requires chemotherapy, in, the, in which case we'd have to send to the cancer disease hospital yeah. now that we have one. Okay. Yeah. By the way, is there a relationship between uh, weight and the flu? Um, not exactly. Uh, uh, not exactly. Yeah. Um, flu by itself, but there can be an element of maybe you know sleep disorders in terms of breathing here and there, which may not be flu in particular. Okay, yeah. I'm asking this because well, I read some article years back about people who are uh, bigger in size yeah. being more predisposed to. Yeah, perhaps I would I would have to read a study. Okay. on the subject, but so far, I don't think that it calls for concern in terms of... There's know, no relationship between the two. I wouldn't say so, because I have not read... Because you know, you've not read on that People who write studies, you know? Yeah. There may be someone who has evidence, who has brought the evidence forward. But um, according to what I know so far, uh, weight by itself does not predispose you to flu. Okay. Yeah. So how do you consider... How do you get knowledge? I mean, now that you've finished your medical yeah. uh, degree, when something new, a new study comes up, yeah. or maybe something that was thought to be one way has now been discovered to be another way. Okay. How are you as a doctor updated on those changes? Or is there some kind of a, a newsletter that they send to doctors around the country every year okay. with the new changes? I know accountants receive practice notes, yeah. for example, from... Uh, from the Ministry of Finance that tell us the changes yeah. with taxes and mm -hmm. yeah. is there something like that for for doctors? Uh, well, in as much as one becomes a doctor when they graduate, but um, in actual sense, you you get the the knowledge once you've actually become a doctor. That's when you begin to learn more things. So you're not alone. You are under a group of more experienced individuals yeah. that are actually training you. So there's always a continuous form of education. So doctors um, are not just there to see patients. Sometimes they would have to go to the hospital much earlier than waking hours just so they can attend class. Oh, yeah. really? Yes. So information depends on your specialty as well, but there mm. are some general things. Like right now we have anthrax, and on my emails, actually, the Zambia Medical Association has sent me a link to something that I need to read 
as it regards, you know, anthrax. Mm. Yeah. Anthrax is not per se a subject that doctors would discuss on a you know, daily basis. It's something that we are now coming to learn more in collaboration with, say, veterinary veterinary doctors. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a form of a one health approach, animals and humans. So we, 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 we are continuously being educated, but mm. also you won't really have to know everything because there's a lot of information out there as well. So yeah. information that is truly worth having will get to us in one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe you can tell us some of the misconceptions you have encountered uh, that relate to your field. Do you know any? I, I wouldn't say that uh, I have misconceptions as it regards the general populace yeah. in terms of you know the ENT services. I feel like uh, most of the misconceptions that I've come to realize are actually among us doctors themselves. Okay. Yeah. Say doctors that are not very aware of ENT, mostly they would think that Mamalo Vachabe, uh, ENT doctors, <laughs> they, they, would, they would feel like there's no burden. Like a lot of people don't realize the burden that that is there in this field yeah. compared to other specialties. Um, I'm privileged to actually currently be you know, working under general surgery because our training requires us to, you know, go through other specialties as well. Yeah. And from what I can see, uh, the, the burden of ENT is generally higher than most specialties I've been to. Okay. Is it because there is a wider umbrella of infections and diseases that you have to deal with, with no, in, I, I, in the field? What makes the burden higher I, for, I, for I, ENT? I... I uh, when I say burden, I think it relates to uh, the resource that is there compared to, you know, other fields. Yeah. Yeah. You may not have as many patients as, say, other fields, but in terms of the special, the, the specialists themselves, they may be fewer. Okay. Um, okay. okay. The, the training programs may not be as straightforward to get in yeah. compared to other fields. So in turn, you, you get to have clinics that end much later compared to other specialties. Mm. You get to have doctors who work maybe longer hours, longer court days or, or anything of that that sort. Okay. Yeah. Are there do we have uh hospitals locally that are just specialized in that? No uh, e ENT? Not that I'm aware of. Not a hospital per se. There may be a few uh private clinics. Get ready mm. yeah, to be amazed. Yeah, not the status of the hospital. Let me see if, you know, some cases here and there. Okay. Yeah, but um, mostly for government hospitals is UTH, Levy, uh, Ndola, uh, that mm. will offer ENT services. So actually a lot of people come even from Livingstone all the way to to UTH just to access that service. So it's, it's something that's not everywhere. Mm, I see why you say these are... Uh, the burden is high. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, you're probably mm. much sought after. Yeah. Because of your unavailability yes. in, that, in that particular field. Mm. By the way, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Hit that notification bell and share. Subscriptions alone on YouTube are decorations. If you don't hit that bell, um, you can catch our previous show with Dr. Katambo where we discussed uh, the, heart, the brain as it relates to all things lifestyle. And today we are with Dr. Shatewa, we're discussing ENT, ears, nose, and throat. I actually am talking to a doctor in this field for the very first time. And so this is uh, quite insightful. I'm, I'm learning a lot. How did your family take your being a doctor? Did they, do you get a lot of calls from family members on health issues? Uh, yeah, even with cases that I'm not really, I, I'm a doctor, I'm not interested in everything medicine. Yeah. I, I've got interest, of course. But I'll be called over other matters, um, and sometimes it's difficult to prescribe things over the phone because to be unprofessional as well. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I get the calls, but usually I appreciate if they can go to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. But but how do you usually respond? Uh, usually, if it's something that I feel uh, we can observe and I can give some advice, mm. maybe I, I can say something about it. But mostly, I would have to follow through and. If it's something that they exist, they would rather they see someone physically. Yeah. yeah. And tell us about doctor's handwritings. What's the issue uh, with doctor's handwritings? I don't think every doctor. Apparently, has. apparently only <laughs> pharmacists can read that handwriting. Um, maybe it comes with people who write a, a lot of stuff. But then I would also mention that I've also 
seen some really good handwriting. Are you the first doctor with a beautiful handwriting? Uh, I can't say mine is beautiful, <laughs> but it, it's not difficult to read. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm definitely working with some, even younger doctors. Uh, yesterday, I was actually complimenting someone over their handwriting. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, anyway, to conclude our discussion today, what would you, as a doctor, mm -hmm. leave with me as an important word of advice? Um, I mean, what basically is that one thing you love to tell people that they should know as a medical doctor generally it doesn't have to be your field what's the one knowledge or one piece of advice you think the public should know yeah. as it relates to their health and how they are taking care of themselves yeah. i would like to hear that so, from you yeah so i appreciate that you particularly asked me about uh, lifestyle as it relates to ear nose and throat um, this is a common question that I get yeah. uh, from older people, younger people, you know, they will ask you, um, is this food good for this? Is, is this food good for that? And um, I, I appreciate that. And I, I would like for people to really care about themselves, to work out, yeah. to, you know, have healthy lifestyles and everything of that form. But also I come to a point of humility when I realize that sometimes nothing can really save you and <laughs> the, the life that we have is really precious because there are some people that have really seen that you have asked everything and it's really negative and yet they have a pathology of some form so um perhaps what i can say is that people should generally be grateful for the life that they have um mm. we can do what we can yes because there's what you can avoid but sometimes it's just by the grace wow yeah you know what i think you are I don't think I've ever heard a doctor speak that way. Uh, Already. <laughs> it was quite a realistic response. Yeah. To think that there are people out there that put their best effort. Something has gone off. I don't know. Oh, okay. What was that? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Do you think that there are people out there who put their best effort and still yeah. end up with definitely uh, with issues? Definitely. Uh, but I, I don't want to say that to yeah. discourage people and to make people live carelessly. Definitely, the science is there, the, the papers are there, people have done research, uh, some, li some lifestyle, uh, you know, some habits like smoking would definitely put you in harm's way. But at the end of the day, um, it's not the only issue. Yeah. There are other factors that come to, you know, to interplay. And um, it's something that's, you know, it, it humbles you when, you when you realize that even as a doctor, you, you can do a lot of things to save a lot of people, but the hospital is full of, you know, sick people who are human beings just like the rest of us and we're not built to live forever after all have you ever yeah. had to tell uh, a patient's family yeah that their loved one has passed away uh that is the job <laughs> <laughs> yeah what's that moment like for you emotionally um, psychologically does that go with you home uh, i can't say it's something that goes with me home on a general scale i yeah. guess grief as it regards to the, you know, the relatives, the doctors, the nurses, everyone involved, grief depends on many factors as well. Yeah, it, the, the, the greatest pain I felt for a patient was when I just started work mm. and there was a young lady who had been in, in our admission for more than a month. So I was taking care of someone for such a long period. Um, you know, I'd formed a bond with, I don't yeah. know if that is encouraged with the family. Yeah. Um, I was hopeful that she would get well and she collapsed, she died. And that, that, that hurt, yes, of course. Um, it would also depend, maybe it's someone who's a geriatric, maybe they are a hundred years old, <laughs> their family has understood, they've lived, you know? Yeah, of course, yeah. we won't say, won't, won't do our best. Did you not see what they said about KK when he, when he passed away? He said, gone too soon. They, they say, gone too soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, okay, every life is precious, of course. Yeah, but anyway, obviously, they but, were joking. But, but factors who, who, who differ, if it's a child, or if yeah. there's something that we could have done, and maybe that's something that but how common is that where someone dies yet there was something that could have been done i mean i know there are many factors that may lead to that but, yeah. but is that something common that happens uh definitely and i won't say it's because people are lazy or they don't want to help but you know our health care system is not as as advanced as say the first world countries yeah yeah so people are really dedicated but sometimes these there may be patient factors as well um we mostly see issues in their end you know 
when a, when a pathology has advanced, yeah. maybe that's when someone has come to the hospital. So you would say, okay, maybe if the, had they come earlier, maybe this issue would have been sorted. Mm, yeah. Mm. Or maybe... Um, I mean, I think no one really wants to go and get tested until yeah, yeah. <laughs> things have gotten out of hand. I think people are generally afraid of what the result will be when they mm-hmm. do a test. Yeah. When they do a test, I, I remember one time I had a, a stomach ache. Mm-hmm. It wasn't serious. It wasn't anything serious. It was like one of those things. Maybe I ate something bad. Yeah. And I told a friend, oh, I, I, I'm experiencing a stomach ache today. And he was like, yeah, go and do a full blood <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I guess you know the f- the f- first feeling I got was why would I want to test like that? Mm-hmm. Why would I want to find out all that? Yeah, yeah, I guess that's a question that many people have when they come when they think of doing a test mm-hmm. for their full body. Yeah. Like what if you discover something? I don't know whether they you encourage people to do early testing or you encourage encourage people to test when they feel the pain. Um, well, I, f- I feel um, on a general scale, in terms of, you know, health as a whole, there are certain issues that, you know, um, there's been some movement, say breast cancer. Yeah. There's there's now a, a wide information in terms of self-breast examination. Mm. You know, people know a lot about maybe even prostate, testicular issues. Yeah. Yeah. So there are things that you can talk about, but maybe in my field, there's not so much, you know, awareness. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't think we've done. I don't as, think I've seen much. anything in, in your yeah, field as in the form to, of a campaign. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> anyway, it's been interesting learning all that I've learned today about this particular field. Trust me. I know there's so many people out there who had no clue mm-hmm. that there was even ENT. Yeah. And I think it's important for people to know these things because people are having health uh, throat issues every now yeah. and then. Uh, people are having uh, nose issues, ear issues yes. every now and then. And we just don't even know where to start from. Yeah, if I went, if you, I went, you know, once your nose is blocked and you can't breathe, you have to breathe through your mouth, then definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Does it ever get that bad where your nose is just. For the my Yeah. I, I know a lot of patients that, that have that problem in particular where maybe they've developed a sinusitis something that you may be familiar with and, no, uh, no 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 i'm not actually yeah but basically uh, there are sinuses which are an extension of the nose mm. or yeah deep in the nose you know they help with humidifying the air um you know for phonation in terms of like voice projection mm. these are spaces that are in the bony compartments just below the eyes and just above them as well so sometimes they, they may get infected um, infection by itself will give you a headache, but if that goes on goes on for a long time, sometimes you can develop these polyps, which are more like tumors. Not really a tumor per se, but they're, they're like growths. Yeah. Um, uh, and and this will, will obstruct your breathing. So you completely can't breathe from your nose uh, if that happens. You may reach that that extent. Yes. And what's the solution? Can you be given medicine for that or do you have to there's remove a, them surgery? There's, there's a medical treatment that is easier for us to give in our setup. Mm. And um, there's also a surgical route, which in most instances patients would need. But also, um, I should do a study about it. Yeah. But from what, what I see, uh, it's quite difficult to schedule too many patients for that one as it is a little bit sophisticated and only a few people can do such a procedure. Okay. Yeah. That one I'm curious about, whether you'd have to rip the nose open uh, or you have to get in from the back of the head. It's called endoscopic sinus surgery. So you go in with specialized equipment mm. where the nostrils themselves and then you get into the sinuses. You clean so out. So you have to have some kind of a screen on yes, the side. Yes, yes, yes. Mm. So it's one field that requires a lot of technology. Among surgeons, I feel very few people are more technologically, you know, uh, involved. Um, we we depend on, you know, high equipment yeah. for us to to do the job. Okay. Yeah. All right. Once again, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe, hit that bell and share. We are, we've come to the end of the show. And um, I hope you guys learned something. If you've learned something or you have a question, leave it in the comments. And we shall see you on Friday for Bible Talks. Please subscribe. Bye-bye. Hey, like what you see? I know you do. Hit the button below to subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification bell.
Ciao.